Loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this hour asking for your blessing and help us to gather together in this webinar. We pray for guidance in the matters at hand and ask that you will clearly show us how to conduct our work in online distance learning with a spirit of joy and enthusiasm despite this new normal. Give us a desire to find ways to excel in our work, help us work together, and encourage each other towards excellence. We ask that we motivate and inspire each other on what we share today to reach higher and farther to the best, even amidst these challenging times. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hi everyone, good afternoon. We are now on the sixth session of our webinar series on our journey with online distance learning. With you today is your moderator. I am John St. Lado Palama from the Office of Silliman Online University Learning. This afternoon, we will learn about asynchronous delivery, a pedagogical approach that is very useful in an online distance learning. We have two speakers this afternoon, and they will share to us their experiences on their topic. Without further ado, may I call on Dr. Dave E. Marshall to welcome our participants for this webinar and to introduce the first speaker. Good afternoon, Philippines, and hello, world. And maayong uh, hapon kanatung tanan. That is good afternoon from. Maying hapon from Dumaguete City, and uh, I would like to thanks also our 43 and counting participants. Uh, some of the familiar names here who attended from the first uh, webinar uh, series that uh, we had. Um, just to mention some, uh, Dr. Torres, uh, thank you. Um, for attending, Sir Edmond, Sir Herbert from AUDRN, uh, Ma'am Jocelyn, uh, Sir Jose Vidal, Ma'am Wu, thank you for it's it long time no here, Ma'am, and hopefully, and uh, we can see in person. I know we are all busy preparing for perhaps um the modular modality of the Negros Oriental High School. We also have Ma'am Luisa is here. Thank you, Ma'am Sara of Aba ICT. And uh, to all our televiewers uh, on Facebook, uh, thank you for joining us and uh, welcome to our sixth um, series, webinar series on online distance learning. And uh, COVID-19 pandemic, provides global uncertainty of things, but on the other hand, the pandemic opened opportunities in all aspects in our life. And one of this is the new normal in teaching and learning. Um, I know many of us are challenged also as we prepare to the kind of flexible learning or modality that we in place in our own university. What I am sure of um, we at Seliman University is confident that we can deliver, and I know many of or or many of you here in your respective university are also confident that we can deliver our own expected outcomes or expected um, deliverables as required or mandated in our syllabus. Today is another day or another afternoon a gathering of inquiry and discussion as we present to you another um, two respective speakers and uh, uh, speakers who will discuss to us another delivery that we feel very significant and important in online distance teaching and learning, particularly on asynchronous learning. 
Last week, two of our speakers discussed to us thoroughly and described and shared their experiences in synchronous learning. This afternoon, the opposite, which is the asynchronous learning. Uh, asynchronous learning is actually the key feature of it, is, uh, is a key feature of successful online learning programs. And we know that uh, the word asynchronous means not keeping time together, which refers to students' ability to discuss information, demonstrate what they learn, and communicate with classmates and instructions on their own time, which they don't need to be in the same classroom or even in the same time zone to participate. In this juncture, let me introduce to you our first speaker for this afternoon. Our first speaker is currently a GA Development Director of ProLife UK, the second biggest um, life insurer in the country, a part-time associate professorial lecturer of De La Salle University, having an 18 years of teaching in the MBA program handling subjects on quantitative methods, insurance and risk management, business ethics, and corporate social responsibility. Uh, our speaker for this afternoon, our first speaker for this afternoon, is a former president of the Philippine E-Learning Society and its current editor-in-chief of the Philippine or the Pels Online Journal. He has been doing online learning for 12 years and he finished BS Statistics and MBA in UP and DBA in DLSU. A sports enthusiast, biking, swimming, trekking, rocket sports. Married with two kids uh, entering college. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, our televiewers, let me introduce to you and transfer the screen to our first speaker, my friend, a colleague of ours in the academe, uh, a longtime friend in the Philippine E-Learning Society, Dr. Dennis Berino. Sir Dennis? Yes. Thank you, um, long time, Dave. Long time no see, actually. Yes, uh, actually, uh, it's been a while. And uh, thank you for inviting me. Maganda rito sa online learning, no? sa online uh, education. Kahit uh, magkalayo tayo, pwede tayong magkasama. And there was somebody who posted a while ago from Angeles City. Imagine, di ba? Welcome, mm -hmm. no? Uh, hindi lang taga Siliman from Dumaguete, which is uh, a very nice place indeed, but also from uh, other parts of the country. It's a pleasure for me to be with you this afternoon to share uh, uh, my perspectives no, on online learning. Si Dave and I, we've been together. We were drawn together by the Philippine E-Learning Society and uh, that's a common bond with us. And um, we've been espousing uh, the adoption and implementation of online learning programs in schools and universities. The, the PELSA organization has been there for more than 15 years. But if you take a look at the application of online learning in the Philippines before the pandemic, uh, there's a very small percentage, really, of educators who are into it for various reasons, really. Uh, but um, with just this particular event, uh, this particular epochal event, everybody transitioned to online learning. Wala po tayong choice ngayon eh. If you want to teach at uh, this juncture, you have to do online learning. Otherwise, hindi ka pwede magturo because the government says, hindi ho tayo pwede magkaroon ng skwela sa mga bata habang wala po tayong vaccine. And so, we now find ourselves now in this particular situation where we are forced to embrace no? technology in education and learning. Na matagal na ho nandiyan dyan. Hindi yan bago. It was not invented because of the pandemic. It's been there. And I know that Dave and I, uh, who are practitioners, are happy that there are more people right now. Quite forced ho kayo. You just have to accept and you have to adapt in this kind of an environment, okay? So, in invite ako ni Dave uh, to talk about uh, asynchronous, no? Asynchronous uh, learning. Let me just 
share my screen with you. Um, okay. So, dinefine na ho kanina ni Dave. Dinaho ako magde-define uh, kung ano yung asynchronous learning. Ano? Asynchronous delivery of learning. And that is, uh, you can learn without uh, the, uh, the element of time and location. Um, curtailing, you know, curtailing you, you can have uh, an organized way of discussing with your classmates or with your teachers for that matter in an asynchronous delivery manner. So let me just uh, share with you uh, the university that I represent, uh, De La Salle. Although right now, I'm sure this is also a problem of Suleiman as well as all the other schools, no? What to do with the physical schools that we have right now, the brick and mortar, because it's a very lonely place. I, I don't know about Suleiman, no? but if you go to La Salle right now, almost there's nobody, nobody inside, no? Because uh, the classes, we started just July 1, we're conducting it uh, on an online learning mode. Okay, so that is the original campus of La Salle. That is the LRT, uh, if you're familiar with the area. Okay, so um, ICT has transformed the classroom environment, the information and communication technology. And uh, Dave said a while ago, I've been doing 12 years of online learning. Um, it started in 2008. Uh, actually, I'm a... I'm a digital migrant because during my time in college, even my master's, wala hong online learning, halos wala hong computer non. Everything was really like IBM. It's better manual, okay? But when I started teaching in 2002, basically I was doing the same things that my teachers were doing 20 years before when I was studying in college. And that is, I mean, different lang ho ng lasal sa UP. We were using whiteboard already, okay? E sa UP ho, chalk. Tsaka blackboard, yan, yan. At wala ho halos computer. At least in Lasal, meron silang power, meron silang computer inside the classroom and uh, overhead projector so you can have your PowerPoint materials. So basically, I was teaching QAMET, Quantitative Methods of Operations Research, in a ma manual basis, okay? Uh, but some, somehow along the road, um, we we adopted the online le learning met methodology for the program. Actually, 20 years na ho ang online learning sa Lasal. We started in 2000. Pero konti lang ho talaga yung mga teachers na into it. I would say not even 20%. No? I don't know about Selman's experience. Not even 20% of the teachers were into online learning because let's face it, teachers are also human beings. We're creatures of habit. We're so used to this brick and mortar classroom setup. And moving into an online environment is very alien to us, despite of the fact na anjan na siya. Okay? But when I saw it in 2008, because I like that. I like that for myself. I like that for my students. And I feel that that's going to be the future of learning. Okay? Kasi tayo yung mga skwelahan. Change agents po tayo, di ba? Dapat tayo yung una nag-embrace ng ICT. Pero we're one of the holdovers. So amazing, no? Being change agent environment, but we're one of the holdovers uh, application of ICT in the class. Before we go into uh, online learning, this is a teaching. What is teaching anyway? Uh, the definition I flashed there is it's a process of attending to people's needs, experiences, and feelings, and intervening so that they learn particular things. And that's what Smith said about teaching. And of of course, we teachers were concerned about the learning experience of our students you know, when they join us in the classroom, when we do our discussions and everything, all the educational activities. And learning is the transformative process of taking in information that when we internalize it and mix with what we have experienced, changes what we know and builds on what we do. So learning is an enabling process for the people who go through this particular exercise. And um, all of us teachers, we're concerned about how we are able to let our students imbibe learning. And I'm sure you're familiar with this taxonomy. And these are different ways from where, from, uh, from where students can, can imbibe learning from us in their engagement with us. And the first thing is the very basic. Remembering, they can recall facts and basic concepts that we discuss them you know, through the assignments that we give them. And second is, after remembering, they have to understand. You know, it's not enough for you to remember the formula of E is equal to MC squared or the Pythagorean theorem or all those others, other things, no? 
But you have to understand saan po ba ginagamit yung formula na to. What is the practical application? And then the third level is, you use information in new situations. So you now have those theories and concepts and you start applying that Sa college, ang application kasi is really maybe case studies, projects. But since I'm teaching in the MBA program, the application of students may be direct to their work. And that is the difference between masters and undergrad, no? Because masters, well, at least the MBA, pro, uh, MBA students, they're full-time. They are working. So when we teach models to them, they can directly apply. And when they apply, they have a higher retention of what they learn. And then after application, you draw connections among ideas to start analyzing things and then you start evaluating and then the creation process now produce new or original work now, for example if you're working in an organization and you le learn for example queuing systems how can i apply now queuing systems so that it will enable me to provide better service to my clients who are lining up for service for the organization and so in a very real sense, as teachers, we're concerned no? about our students moving up from the remembering phase up to the creating phase. No? And I'll try to connect now this Bloom's taxonomy later on with the topic that's assigned to me, and that is uh, synchronous delivery. Now, before we go into that, let's take a look at ICT. Ano nga ba yung ICT? I'm sure you're familiar. These are the devices, these are the networking components. These are applications and systems that combine allow people, allow organizations, businesses, schools, governments to interact in the digital world. So that's what the ICT device, uh, ICT does for us. And the ICT has been leveraged for economic, for social, so social and interpersonal transactions and interactions. So individuals now can move from personal face-to-face -face interactions to ones in the digital space. So it has ushered in the fourth industrial revolution. So it's common for you to hear, no? Ayaw nila ng ICT kasi it's impersonal. O eh kasi eh, sanay ho tayo sa face-to-face. -face. But now that there's this ICT, eto na ho yung bagong level of interaction now that non-face-to-face. -face. Okay, I work for a life insurance company. Before, I've been with the industry for more than 25 years. And before, hindi ho allowed the insurance commission, the governing body of all life insurance companies, for you to sell to your clients on a non-face-to-face. -face. Dapat kung magbenta ho kayo ng insurance, nasa harap niyo ho yung kliyente. Para alam niyo na siya yung binibentahan niyo, you can get information from the particular uh, prospect, and all the things that you're going to be discussed, you're doing it on a person-to-person -person basis. And nag-ECQ. Eh, paano ho yan? Paano yung mga ahente na ang kanila hong income is based on close businesses? Eh kung hindi sila magbebenta ng non face to face, ah uh, wala silang ikitain. So the insurance commission, cognizant of the limitation that agents and insurance companies face in the ECQ allowed non face to face intervention. So ngayon ho yung mga ahente ho natin, pwede nung namin ho sa industry, pwede nung magbenta. NFTF, we call it non face to face. So, ganun din ho nangyari sa mga eskwelahan, no? Pwede na hong magturo kahit ho hindi ho face to face. Of course, you're going to tell me maraming constraints. Merong connectivity problem. May problema yung mga estudyante at mga teachers sa ownership ng gadgets. You know, if you're going to focus on all those problems, you will not be able to move forward. Okay, these are constraints. How do we address them? I'm sure there are creative ways for us to be able to address the concerns facing us. Kasi hindi naman ho perfect world yung uh, ICT and online environment. So a lot of issues, but if we realize what are those things, napakreative man ho ng human mind. Eh. Necessity is the mother of invention. And so ngayon ho, we're into it already. So later on, we'll be maybe making some uh, research paper, some studies about our particular journey migrating from face-to-face -face or non-face-to-face. -face. And I hope that you can contribute no, to this body of knowledge, no, but pressing now the importance as well as the value of online learning. Kasi hindi naman ho versus to eh. Face-to-face -face versus online learning. Hindi po, it's a complementary situation. Na pwede ka mag-face-to-face, -face, pwede ka mag-online learning. You can do fully online learning if you want. 
hindi po to ask against them. Okay? So, yun po yung dapat na perspective po natin. Okay? So, ICT in education, this is the mode of education that uses information and communications technology to support, enhance, and optimize the delivery of information. And so, the increase in the use of ICT in education with integrating technology to curriculum has significant and positive impact on students' achievements. This is just one source. I'm sure when you do your research, you can find a lot of positive. Meron hong naysayers, of course. Nila timaalis po yan. Pero in the run up to the in the in the run up to the application of ICT and the embracing of ICT and every other aspect of human life. We cannot be far behind. As I said, education has changed agents. We have to be there at the forefront. And it has been shown that students who continuously ex are exposed to technology through education have better knowledge, they have better presentation skills, they have innovative capabilities, and are ready to take more efforts into learning as compared to their counterparts. And if only for the fact that the students that you're teaching right now are digital natives. Pinanganak po sila sa ganitong environment. Parang they don't need to learn how to swim. You just throw them in the water and then they can move around. Ganun po yung mga bata ngayon. As early as two, three years old, they can already manipulate cell phone. Although I don't agree with that. No? Ganun ka bata, no? Ganun ho ang environment na ginagalawa ng mga bata. So it's best for us no? to be able to uh, adapt ourselves, no? Yung mga tulad ko na mga migrants to embrace this and to move forward with this particular application. Okay? So, um, online learning and education, um, it takes place over the internet. It catalyzes the pedagogical shift in how we teach and learn. And the shift is away from top-down lecturing and passive students to more interactive, more collaborative approach where students and instructor co-create the learning process. Hindi na ho lahat ng learning, lahat ng educational perspective will come from us teachers. The students become empowered because of their access to a lot of useful resources in the web. And it's facilitated through ICT. So these are the components. Of course, you have to have technology access. You have to have guidelines and procedures. You have to have participation among the faculty and uh, the students. You have to have collaborative learning. It's not like there's a lecturer and then you listen to me and then that's it. You have to find ways to be able to engage your students in, an, in a meaningful interaction. You talk about transformative learning huh, when you do online learning. learning not only about learning, but technology and learning about oneself as well. And of course, you have to evaluate the process. No? What are the things that are working well for us? What are the things that we need to improve on? So that as we move forward, we can be better. And so, Dave, I want to say that it's not about versus, because it's not against it. Because both can coexist in an online learning environment. We can use synchronous and we can use asynchronous as well. So what is synchronous learning? Let's focus on the left side first. It takes place in real time with groups of learners. In, this, in the context of online learning now, a syn synchronous learning is when you do your video lectures and everybody's there. You have, you have the teacher and then you have the students all logged in at the same time. From the term synchro, you are at sync no? in terms of the time element. So second, it can be done, uh, synchronous learning can be done either through live webinars, it can be done through instant messaging and virtual classrooms. And it's collaborative and feedback friendly because right there and then, students can ask feedback, teachers can ask questions. There's instant uh, feedback between the teachers and the students and the students among themselves, which is not present in asynchronous learning. It doesn't mean there's no feedback, but the feedback is delayed, okay? Now, synchronous learning can be completed through online courses. It can be done through emails, blogs. In, in LaSalle, my asynchronous learning uh, basically makes use of online discussion boards. 
I make use of a lot of that and I will be sharing with you later on the learning management system I use and how my asynchronous learning is set up. The learners complete their course in their own time, regardless of location, okay? So you can have participants like we have uh, we have in uh, we have in Angeles. Kung in Angeles City participant natin, if this is a synchronous uh, event, uh, inside the classroom, rather, uh, hindi siya pwedeng makasama rito. Pero since synchronous, uh, separated by time, pwede siya um, uh, load up manner, the definition of synchronous learning, and then the asynchronous learning. Uh, ang one of the significant things about the asynchronous learning is being learner-centered. So you're moving now, the discipline of learning, not coming from the teachers themselves, but you're putting, slowly putting that students at the center. And so it, it will involve a certain kind of discipline for the student. Okay? Kasi, dinadala mo siya sa center of being responsible no, for the learning process. No? So meron kang feedback, it's just deferred, unlike uh, asynchronous learning where feedback can be instantaneous. Okay? So um, other things, what are the pros of synchronous learning? There is high interaction, there is feedback is immediate, and learner questions can be answered in an instant. Okay? What about asynchronous? You can do this you can be flexible as learners go at their own particular pace. It's cost effective. You don't have to travel. Then your instructor costs. Alam nyo ha, share ko lang sa inyo. Uh, ngayon semester, no, bumabaho ang general, general um, um, enrollment sa La Salle, Manila. Pero ang napansin ho namin sa MBA program, mas marami yung nag-enroll na bagong freshman. Ang bakit ho? Kasi dati, yung mga working uh, people who want to take up MBA and they cannot because they have to leave their work or they have, can only allocate so much of their time to go to school now have more freedom to do so because of the online learning setup and the asynchronous learning setup that it provides. Okay, So you can scale training and learning as you can train a lot of learners all at once. Although yung Zoom naman, pwede ka magkaroon ng 200 audience and you can have 500. I think meron mga ganong classic applications. Ano? Pero parang nagsalita ka na lang nun, nag-lecture ka na lang without the benefit of feedback. Kasi has dumabag dumadaming audience mo, hindi ka na pwede makapag-entertain ng questions as intimate as you can in a smaller landscape. Now, uh, in an asynchronous learning, uh, that can be facilitated. Although meron ding challenge no, pag malaki masyado ang grupo. Kasi mahirap din magbigay ng feedback, especially if you also have certain limitations. And so what about the cons? Pag meron pros, meron cons. Parang burgers and fries ko lagi magkasama po yan. No? So in the cons for synchronous learning is learners adhere to a specific schedule. Like yung synchronous learning ko sa Lasal ngayon are the video lectures. I'm getting ahead here. Uh, we have 14 sessions in the sal. My schedule is every other session I have synchronous, and the other one, the next session is asynchronous, and the other one is synchronous. And so on the synchronous uh, segment, I expect everyone to be logged in. Okay? And to listen to the lecture that I have prepared for them. Okay? So yun yung sinasabi rito na you are, uh, you are, you uh, attend a specific schedule, no? But you can access uh, this anywhere you are because now it's an uh, online environment na ngayon. Kaya uh, we're looking at promoting the program. Kasi dati meron mga gusto mag-enroll sa amin, mga Southeast Asian countries. They cannot because of the distance uh, problem. But because of the online learning environment, it's opened up the borders of, uh, of uh, applicants. So I hope it's going to be true for Silliman as well that you will be able to attract people from other countries other regions as well as other countries no? uh, in the ASEAN region as, or even outside uh, as your students. No? Some learners may feel they're not receiving the individual attention that they need no? because you're part of a big class. Unlike in an asynchronous, you can have one-to-one -one discussion with your, uh, with your team. And quality of the session depends on the instructor. Of course, it goes without saying, it depends on the teacher. No? Now, the cons for asynchronous learning is the contract 
through asynchronous learning may be limited. Okay, not as what you have in synchronous learning. Uh, if the face-to-face -face is important to you, you will not have that in, syn in synchronous learning. Leave some learners feeling isolated. No, kasi nga, feeling nila, dahil hindi ko nakikita yung classmates ko, hindi ko nakikita yung teachers ko, parang hindi sila sa, sanay sa ganun klaseng environment. Okay? And learners need to be self-disciplined, sinabi ko nito kanina, and motivated to complete their courses. Now, I think I'm advantaged because I handle MBA programs. Kaya yung mga estudyante ko sa MBA, hindi naman ho yung pinilit ng mga magulang nila na mag-MBA. And most of them, they motivated themselves to go back to school to take on master's further studies. And so there's a higher sense of discipline whenever you give them assignments, whenever you engage with them, you feel this is not a negative thing I'm saying against undergrads or even high school. And this is just a truism no? Na, because they're much more mature, uh, they're uh, more responsible in terms of their engagement in class. No? So having said that, let's go back now to the Bloom's taxonomy. And there are six aspects here. And I believe given uh, what we have discussed so far on asynchronous learning, this particular segment on application, analysis, evaluation, and creation, the higher levels of learning are more touched on by asynchronous learning. And how is that? What kind of asynchronous activities will lead towards this no? than the two, uh, than the two in the, at the bottom? First is when you assign case studies. In case studies, there is a need for you to do a lot of analysis and evaluation before you do the presentation in class. It's not like you're just listening to a lecture, just trying to remember, just trying to understand here. You're trying now to apply the concepts, the theories and the principles that you've learned in solving a particular case study that you assigned to. And you know naman the case method is largely used in, in graduate school. No? especially in the MBA program. It's a staple, no? So you have a problem to solve, and then you discuss it among yourselves. It's in a synchronous way. You will have to find a way to be able to engage with your, uh, with your group mates to be able to discuss this and then present this in class. Whether the presentation is, a, is, a, is in a synchronous setup, you're presenting to the whole class, or it can be an asynchronous setup because in my class, all case study presentations are done asynchronously. I will show it to you later on how it happens no? through discussion boards. Second is business research. And so you can assign specific topics. For example, you discuss uh, forecasting models or network models. You can ask them, look for companies in YouTube who posted applications of these models in their organizations and how they benefited from this particular from, their, from this particular application of quantitative uh, modeling. And so you're able now to see the application of the models that you have un remembered and understood in class. You try to uh, analyze now how this is set up and try to envision is this something that I will be able to apply in my our projects and feasibility studies you out of the classroom setup when you have assignments like this one. You move out, normally you do it with a group. And uh, when you do it with a group, there's a lot of engagement, no? of application, analysis, evaluation, to try to be able to come up with the uh, results no? the, for the project and feasibility study that was assigned to you. You can other field-based activities. You can do uh, uh, you can visit communities. Uh, you can visit uh, government agencies or businesses in relation to what you're studying, in relation to a phenomena that you would like to uh, experience or that take a look if it's being manifested there. And so those are asynchronous activities that you can be engaged in. You can do gamification as I do in my in my class. I assign them games so that it will make things a little bit more different for them. They're not only listening to lectures, they're not only doing web research and case studies. The game creates excitement among students. But be very clear that you're using the game not as a means to make them happy or make them uh, 
make them in, make the experience enjoyable, but you will have to be able to tie it up with the learning process in class. And so the game that I use for my class is tied up with a particular model or concept that we have. And uh, lastly, you can flip the classroom to a synchronous activity. No? Now flipping the classroom, um, if you're not familiar with this term is, you video yourself, you video the particular lecture that you would like to discuss with your students. That's an asynchronous activity. And then you post that particular video in a site, in a website. Uh, in a, if you're, you have a learning management system, you post it in a particular site there. And then you tell them to view your lecture. And then what do you do when you go back to the synchronous setup in the classroom is, you now dispense with a whole lecture but you just try to figure out if there are certain things that they don't understand and you talk of applications already. So it's complementary, no? And so you're able to maximize now the use of the synchronous classroom engagement by not spending too much time on the lecture, but taking a look at how to be able to, uh, how you can discuss the problems or of the students in terms of what you have uh, videoed in the lecture or how you can apply this, uh, these particular things that you have discussed with them. So, um, so those are the synchronous activities uh, that uh, I have thought of. I'm sure you can add more to these things uh, in your particular list. Now, I, ha I have here my learning management system, but I, I will shift to the live one uh, because this is a screenshot. Let me just uh, share the. Um, we're using right now. Um, Canvas as our learning management system in Dallas University. And uh, let me just share with you. So this is my actual, no? My actual learning management system for my quantitative methods class. This is session one. And you can see here, I've already labeled here that this is a synchronous activity. And so the students know that, you know, we're going session one, we're going to be doing a video meeting, video lecture, video meeting for session one. That's the first day on. And then I have all the course materials that I have here. No? Uh, for, for that particular discussion, you have here the uh, presentation materials, you have your assignments. And then before, before, the, before the pandemic, I did not video myself in class. So my students, they listen to me. And then they just have a remembrance of the things that I said. Some write furiously. And you know, some of my students, I noticed uh, in the previous semester, trimesters, they were videoing certain segments of my lecture on their own cell phones. But now, since we're using, uh, I'm using Zoom primarily, you know, but you can use Google Meets. Uh, this this uh, Canvas LMS, there uh, is uh, a video uh, material, but it's limited yung scope, niya, so I'm using Zoom. So after, after the lecture, I share the video lecture with them as a reference. So if there are things that they missed out on, because I talk very fast, like I talk now, they can review to this particular feature. That's an advantage no? uh, that I see also for, for them, no? that they have an additional, additional um, uh, resource. Now, let's go to session number two. See? Session number two, the next session, is an online discussion forum asynchronous. And this one is primarily uh, fueled by discussion boards. And so... I assign out groups for individual activities. There are groups who will do their case studies. There are groups who will do web research assignments on applications of the models we have discussed. So for example, web business research on application of probabilities, application of binomial distribution, application of statistics, application of normal distribution. And then I create a discussion board where the students now will engage in an asynchronous discussion of that topic that was assigned. And because by its nature, unlike the synchronous session where it lasts for three hours, this one is for three days. Now why three days? Because they're not, when you do asynchronous, it's not expected that you start from a particular time and then you're there for the whole duration. My, my three days is, for example, a month, in and take a look at what's happening and post something and then go out 
and then you can come in three three hours after and take a look at what and then you can comment and then you can go out and then you you can look for a web research a web source outside in relation to what's happening inside the discussion board and then go back in and then share that and then make a comment so that is the engagement that you have now you talk you converse quote unquote in the discussion boards that were created and then unlike the synchronous activities where where it's thinking on your feet when you are asked a question by your teacher or when you ask teachers question or ask questions from each other here you can ask questions and if you don't know the answer you can pause for a while and you can go to your a google source or any other source which can help you amplify the answer and that is the beauty of asynchronous no the facility for you to look for sources so that you can contribute more to the learning process of students and that is what we're saying that it's now more learner centered because the teachers are still here but the teachers are not me i'm not i do not dominate the discussion boards anymore i'm there to guide them uh, to maybe if there are conflicts to um to um resolve certain conflicts but by and large if i'm satisfied with the flow of discussion i let the students uh be no but then again because they're masters masterial students there's a, a higher level of maturity in the way they conduct their online discussion and so that's uh my asynchronous and then my second one is there's asynchronous and then there's synchronous asynchronous i told you no so it's alternating and so that's how I do my uh, asynchronous setup. As I said a while ago, it's not versus. It's synchronous and asynchronous because both have advantages, both have values, or both have disadvantages as well. But when you pair them together, uh, it will provide you as a teacher the best benefit to being able to bring your student from understanding from remembering to understanding analysis evaluation to creation learning the higher forms of learning that we want from them. okay so as a last word um online learning it's like uh when you go to Dumaguete port there are ships berthed there the online learning is like the sea no it's going to lift all the boats there meaning it's going to lift all the boats it's going to lift us up into a higher level of competency, a higher level of engagement. And I'm kind of hoping that even when the pandemic is over, that we will now take a look at the way we teach, not only in terms of the brick and mortar classroom, but do online learning as well. A partnership, best of both worlds, really. And so with that, I, I end my, uh, my discussion. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, Dave Jung, question and answer is later na lang. Uh, Jan, yeah, you're the moderator. Oh, Jan. Okay, so thank you so much, sir, for um, the very inspiring and illuminating words of experiences. For Okay, so um, I would like to introduce our second speaker. Our second speaker is a graduate of Silliman University, with a degree of Bachelor of Science in Business Computer Application, and of course, a graduate of Master's in Information Technology at St. Paul University, Philippines, Tugigaraw City. She has been an IT instructor um, in different schools, and she is now a faculty of Business Analytics Department of College of Business Administration here in Siliman University. She is a trainer, a lecturer, facilitator, documenter during the day or our access project with Suleiman University as business development service provider. She is also a facilitator and lecturer during the Sangguniang Kabataan mandatory training. Also again a lecturer facilitator of municipal leadership governance program module one under Suleiman University Governance Affairs Center. Let us all welcome Assistant Professor Myla Jean P. Sardan. Mom? Okay. Good afternoon. With you this afternoon, and Mr. Marshall and Sir Dave was able to 
invite me to be part of this webinar and I'm I am honored to share with you what are in using the asynchronous delivery. So for, um, as an IT instructor, delivery for quite some time, but still face discussion. So it was just a supplemental tool. However, with the pandemic, during the summer, we were able to uh, go on full blast, full blast online. And that is why I would now share to you what are my experiences and the uh, the benefits and the tips that I can share to you with regard to asynchronous learning. So let me just um, share my screen. So these, reco uh, these practices, these recommended practices, share um, to, my, to my students. So I will be talking this afternoon, the forms of asynchronous delivery that I have been using, the benefits that I have experienced, and uh, the tips that I can share to you. So for me, asynchronous delivery is best for uploading resources and assignments because when we prepare our course outline, when we prepare our syllabus, we already have in mind activities that we uh, give to us. So before we record our lectures, before we do our uh, different activities, we first upload our eBooks or uh, if we have PowerPoint slides, we first convert it to a PDF file so that they can still, or they will be able to scan the, the notes in their PowerPoint slides before they will listen to your recorded lecture. Or actually, it is uh, an option. Either you send to them first the PowerPoint slide converted to PDF. The reason why we convert this to PDF so that it's easier for the students to scan and to open the file because sometimes with if you just send them to if you just uh, send them the PowerPoint slide uh, there are some students who would say that they cannot open because the version that they are using is lower compared to the PowerPoint version that they are using so there are some problems like that and it's quite heavy especially if the if the PowerPoint slide is quite big so. Uh, it would be better if you just convert them to PDF and then before they will listen to your recorded lecture or you might also immediately update or, or upload the, the recorded lectures online. So for me, I first upload the PowerPoint slide so that they will have an idea or any ebooks that they can use as um, reference during the discussion and you uh, record your lectures because it's different when you do your um, video conference sessions because everybody uh, all the students and the teacher are uh, logged in at the same time but then there are some students who have problems with their internet connection some have hardware problems like some during my um, summer class, some were simply using their mobile phones. So it was quite different. It was quite difficult for them to just go live every, every session. So they uh, appreciated the recorded lectures because they can download it anytime and then they can listen to your discussion and then they will just post uh, the, the, their questions on the forum which I will also be discussing how forums can be very useful. Then another 
um, recorded lecture that you can use would be the Loom next slides. And then another form that I have been using is the forum. I also made use of chat. I also made use of emails and um, the short quizzes. So for uploading of resources and assignments, as I have said earlier, um, this is where I upload my eBooks, my PowerPoint. So videos that you can students are able to, to, for example, answer the questions that are presented on the video and it will not proceed until the students are able to answer. So you can upload that at a separate time. So instead of the students um, answering the interactive video at the same time, they can download it anytime. Of course, you have to have some restrictions or you have to give them passwords so that they cannot be accessed by uh, any other person. Or you probably have uh, videos from YouTube or from other sources that you can share to them as a supplement to your discussion. In that way, it would not also be, be boring for the students uh, to just interact with the students or the teacher uh, all the time. In fact, in, in our classroom discussion, we also uh, do this. We also upload uh, videos or we also give them videos aside from uh, our own discussion. So what's, what's good with uploading these resources and assignments to your platform, for example, for Siliman, we have the MySoul, is that students can download this anytime. And of course, what's good for them is they can view them multiple times. So they can listen to it, they can read it multiple times before they will be joining. your live discussions because after you upload all these live showing out important things in the chapter that is being discussed. So uh, just to give you an idea on how I record my lecture. So uh, I first, what is more most convenient for me is the use of PowerPoint. PowerPoint has the record slideshow uh, from 2000 and higher versions, you have 2010 and higher versions of Microsoft Office, you can record your slideshow and you can actually record your narration. It's not the same, it's not the usual slideshow, but this time you can record your narration of you on that same screen, on that same slide. So while you are talking, they can also see you talking. But with lower versions, uh, they, you cannot have the video, but they can just listen to your voice. Now, what's good with, and then you listen to it, and then you don't like your introduction, so you can record it again or you have now reached up to slide number five. But for slide number five, uh, there is uh, an interruption. There is a noise interruption. Your chicken crowds, there can be necessary noise in the background. So you will stop there and then you will record it again because you don't want that unpleasant noise in the background. So you can actually do that with um, Microsoft PowerPoint, but you just make sure that from beginning and start recording from current slide. Cursor is whatever is your current slide that will uh, that is where the recording will start. Because if you click by chance, start the previous slides will be deleted and will be replaced by your new, new recorded narration. So that is just, you just have to be careful because it might, it might take time if you will start 
recording from the beginning when in fact you were supposed to be done with that. So what, uh, why do I use um, PowerPoint slides with recorded narration is that it's, it's a common presentation tool. It's familiar to me. So it's, I, I think it's also familiar to almost all of us. Or if you don't like to use PowerPoint, you can also use the its equivalent presentation tool. For other operating systems, they have their equivalent uh, presentation tool as well that you can apply and this is what I have been saying it allows you to edit your narration per slide so you don't have to killer slide and then edit it record your narration again and then proceed with the next uh, with the remaining slides file with the recorded narration sometimes it can be heavy and uh, depending on your hardware requ requirements depending on your internet speed um, uploading the PowerPoint file can take time and it could also take time in downloading on the students end but then if you export it as a video says in your PowerPoint versions of Microsoft Office but then if you export it as a video so they will also download it you will upload it as a video you will uh, they will download it as a video and they can immediately play it even in their phones and for us for uh, because we have the MySoul platform, we upload it in MySoul, but if the video or the file is quite big, we have the option to upload it in Google Drive or in YouTube. I've been using, I was able to use to record my lecture discussions is the Loom software. This is an extension that is uh, currently available in Google Chrome. So you will notice that I have encircled here. This is the, the logo of Loom. You have to add it, add it as an extension to your uh, browser in Google Chrome. And then you have to sign in using your uh, Gmail account. In our case, the SU email account. And then what's good with Loom is that you actually have two options. You can share your screen only without your face appearing on the screen, or you can share both the screen and then the students would also be able to see your uh, face talking. So, um, I have placed there how to add the Loom extension. It's under Google Chrome. So it has an easy to use screen recording discussion as well. What's good with Loom is that it will upload it in their own site and then you can just share the link to your class. So I, uh, you can just give them the link and then they can visit it using that particular link. The problem with Loom is meaning to have to be online while you do the recording. In contrast to your PowerPoint, wherein you can do it offline and then upload it. Uh, that's the only time that you will need the internet connection. But for Loom, it's internet dependent. So, uh, but with Loom, it has a better video trimming capability because it's, it's immediately converted as a video. And then you can immediately edit or trim some parts of the video that you don't want to be included. So that's uh, good with Loom. And as I have said, it is immediately uploaded in the Loom site as well. But the most available tool is a smartphone. We uh, almost all of us have the smartphone and you can just take a video just like how you do take videos during your normal activities 
So you just take a video of yourself or you can let somebody hold the phone for you and then you can do the discussion. So it's like being in your own classroom if you want to be in your own classroom, but then instead of your students uh, sitting in front of you, there is only one person in front of you holding the phone and then you can upload that video using your phone you can upload it in youtube if you have a channel or you can upload it in google drive or again in mindsoul so uh, um, with smartphones it has very limited trimming capabilities uh, you don't have you, you need an external um, video editor if you want to make your video uh, more nice to look at. But then, if the purpose is for you to deliver your discussion, your lecture, then a smartphone is also a good tool. The uh, other form of um, asynchronous delivery that I have been using, and I find it very useful during the two uh, summer classes that I had, is the use of forums. Forums or discussion boards will allow you to post questions. Okay, so after you discuss chapter one, uh, you will create a forum. And in the forum, you can post questions for everybody to answer and discuss. So the forum is similar to having uh, your students in front of you in a classroom discussion, except that um, they're not physically with you. So in the classroom discussion, we give out questions to anybody. Everybody can hear your question. Everybody can hear the replies of your classmates. And then uh, another would, would uh, add to what has been said by the other classmate. So it's also the same with forums. It's like uh, talking about still talking about your topic to talking about the subject that is being discussed and um, students can butt in students can give their own answers because sometimes if you do live discussions not everybody is given the chance to to answer but with forums students have uh, the chance to answer because they can open it and they can type their replies and then the, the teacher can also um, send their own replies. With forums, it also allows public and private replies. It's up to you how you set the setting. If you want uh, just public replies only, so everybody gets to see the answer of everybody. Or you can also allow private replies because there are some students who would prefer sending you um, private replies. Uh, with forums, there can be uh, email notifications can be sent to your email so that uh, or every time there are replies to your forum. So even if you're offline or even if you are not logged into your to the to my soul, you can still look at their replies and then it's up to you if you want to answer it directly or at least you have, uh, knowledge that these people have answered at this particular time and then they will be able to uh, see your reply also if you want to reply at that moment or a reply by the next day or by the next meeting. Uh, I use forums as uh, somehow a substitute for my class participation. Uh, because as I have said earlier, when you do class, when you do live discussions, video conference uh, sessions, not everybody will be able to talk and have the chance to talk because you only have, for example, one and a half hour to discuss. Uh, with forums, when I post a question, for example, if I have 40 students or the second summer I had eight students, everybody gets a chance to reply. So for, for other students, based on their feedback, they prefer the forums because they are more comfortable typing their answers than talking. Although they know that their classmates will still be able to um, read their answers, but they're more comfortable typing their answers. Uh, they have more time 
to, to think about their answers before they click send. So that is why I always use forums for my class participation or if I have uh, questions that I would like them to answer as a supplement to my um, discussion. Then I also use um, chat and email. Now in my soul, we have the live chat sessions and we also have the private chat. With the live chat sessions, this means that everybody uh, needs to be online at the same time. It's similar to video conference, but uh, the difference is that you don't talk, okay? But you just type your answers. This can be good if you have only a few students, but if you have a lot of students, say 40, this might be uh, difficult uh, for you to manage. But it would be, it would also depend on the, the topic that you are discussing. So um, with chat sessions, these are recorded. So what's good with this is for those students who are, for example, absent for that particular time, because uh, they would tell you that they had a problem with their internet connection or for whatever reasons they were not able to attend your discussion, they would still be able to know what has been discussed because the chat sessions are recorded. So even if these chat sessions are synchronous, but because they are recorded, so that uh, makes it still part of a synchronous delivery because students have the chance to, to uh, review what has been discussed. So they would know also uh, additional things that you have been discussing in the chat. And then in my soul, we also have the private chat, meaning to say students can send you private messages for clarifications regarding um, the answer that was marked wrong probably, and they would like to ask why. Now they are, they are ashamed to ask it in a forum. So they will send you a private chat or they are having problems with um, their internet connection, they, they send you a private chat as well. So they, you can also reply to these private chats. And then anytime that you want to, or depending if you would like to answer on a particular uh, scheduled time also. And then clarifications about the, the subject matter. For email, we have been using email for quite some time and uh, students have been sending emails as well to us uh, as clarifications to clarify something, to ask something about a certain topic, etc. So that is why emails are also a good form of asynchronous delivery. They can, they can send you an email, they can ask you a question, and then you can reply to it um, as well. Now, I also make use of short quizzes. Now, <clears throat> these short quizzes, I consider them as asynchronous. It's different from the chapter exams or major exams that I give to my students. These short quizzes, I treat them as asynchronous uh, because they are there for a certain period of time. It's longer. Okay, for example, at the start of the semester, before uh, discussing chapter one, I will give a pretest to my students. Now, there are two purposes why I give the pretest. One is to, of course, test their base knowledge about that particular subject. The second is for them to be oriented with how an online quiz works, how an online quiz looks like. So that is also my purpose of the pretest. So with the pretest, uh, different with my chapter exams or major exams wherein they have to be online uh, at the same time and you get to see them answering the, the quizzes or the exams. For the pretest, uh, I say, for example, I will make it available for two weeks so that uh, this is to give time for the late enrollees because sometimes 
uh, some students won't be able to attend immediately on the first week of classes. So, 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 so that they still have the chance to answer um, the pretest, then I make it available for, uh, for two weeks and they can take it anytime. So it's just a very uh, short quiz. For example, consists of, it is composed of 10 questions and for each question, it is a different question type so that somehow they will also be oriented with um, the different types of questions that I will be giving uh, during major exams. So I give them, for example, one true or false, one essay, one multiple choice, one matching type. So somehow uh, they are answering the pretest to test their knowledge at the same time they are being oriented with how an online quiz works. So the same purpose also with the post test, just like, for example, just like in our classroom discussion, after our discussion, we want to give a, a short quiz just to check if they are listening. So you can also give a post test to, uh, that is valid for um, depending on you, it can be valid for 24 hours or for um, several days if you like. So what are the benefits that it has given me as a teacher in this online uh, distance learning? Or I guess some of you would also agree, students learn at different times. This is also a benefit for the students because they can learn at different times at their own pacing, although it's not really in their own pacing because we do have a schedule as to when we will discuss chapter one and when should we start with chapter two, but at least they have enough time to, to study about a particular topic. So I had students in my uh, summer classes wherein it's quite difficult for them to be online always, uh, every session. And they are uh, glad that we do also asynchronous sessions because they said that uh, they have, there are a lot of them in the house and it's difficult for them to go online at the, uh, every meeting because there are lots of children, it's quite noisy, it's difficult for them to to uh, concentrate to what the teacher is discussing. So uh, asynchronous delivery uh, works also for them. So for us, it also, it gives them, uh, it gives us uh, the time to, to listen or to know our students more to which uh, activities would fit our type of students that we had for that particular mm -hmm. um, class. It's more convenient, it's flexible for both students and teacher. More convenient because um, you just have to upload the resources and you will not be um, talking all the time, especially if uh, the first semester is about to start. So uh, our schedule would probably from, would start from 8, 8.30 to 12 or 8.30 to uh, four to five, if you will do all those live discussions that can be quite heavy on our internet data. And of course, it can also be a very um, inconvenient for the teacher. But then with asynchronous, somehow it gives us time to rest. You can schedule, like for example, for my 8.30, I will do my live discussion. And then for my second, uh, class, I will do asynchronous. It gives you time to rest, but at the same time, uh, you are able to answer also to the queries of your um, students. So students can participate on their own time. So if they are not able to, to answer your questions, for example, in a forum on that particular schedule, and then they happen to, or they log into, the, into your platform by by five o'clock in the, in the afternoon, they can still participate in the discussion. And then it is also location independent. When you say location independent, it, mean, it means that students can access your uh, resources 
the, the platform for my soul, for example, anywhere as long as internet is available. So it's also internet speed friendly. It's, uh, I consider it internet speed friendly because it, it makes use of uh, lesser use of internet data and it doesn't need a very high speed in order for you to do asynchronous sessions in contrast to your um, live discussions or to your video conference sessions. Uh, for me, this uh, asynchronous sessions somehow uh, makes the students less discouraged with online learning, especially that um, this has been, we started with full blast online learning for summer and some students were not ready with a the gadget. They don't have the laptop, they don't have the, the desktop, they only have the mobile phones, but their mobile phones are not that high tech also. So it's difficult for them to go live every time there is a meeting with a teacher. So, or when it's their time to talk, uh, they are cut off, their internet connection is unstable, so they get discouraged. Uh, so if they are discouraged, then the tendency is they don't, uh, they don't want to, to attend your classes anymore and they would have a lot of uh, complaints about, about the subject, about online learning and everything. But since this is a new normal, I always uh, tell my students that this is our new normal, this is our trend now. So we have to adapt to it. And for us to be able to, to enjoy we have to embrace the new normal. We have to, this is a, this is a um, collaboration between the teacher and the students. I, I tell them, I will help you how to navigate uh, my soul, how to do the activities. I do that every, uh, every start of the semester. And then, but you also have to do your own share of your effort. You don't have to, uh, to depend on the teacher all the time. So you have to be able to learn how to navigate it yourself. But the activities that you will be uploading uh, should also not be heavy for them because if they become discouraged, the tendency is they don't want to, to learn anymore. They don't want online learning and the learning would stop there or they don't, they don't enjoy. So they would drop out or they would be absent from your class all the time or most of the time. So for me, asynchronous sessions will really give benefit to both the teachers and for the students. Now, um, I would just like to share to you some of the tips that I have learned during my um, summer classes. Um, Number one is you post your schedule per week or per month because this schedule, like for example, in our summer class, it was a daily uh, schedule from Monday to Saturday. So every Monday or within the week, I post the, the schedule for that particular week or on a Friday, I post a schedule for the next week so that students will be guided on what to do when they would go live. So if you have a scheduled uh, video conference on a Friday, then you will have asynchronous sessions before Friday. So they would know when to have to ensure that they, they have an internet connection at that particular time, especially if it's a major exam. If there is a scheduled internet uh, downtime or if there is a scheduled brownout in their, in their area, they know where to go for them to be able to attend your video conference session. And um, there are still some students who are using mobile data for their connection so that we really have to consider these things. So that is why posting the schedule ahead of time would give them uh, their own, um, they, it would allow them to schedule also when they should have their mobile data and they should be able to be present and they should have, they make sure that they have a good internet connection at that particular time. 
um, I also create a forum for announcements. In my soul, we already have one forum for announcements. So I would suggest that there, uh, you only have one forum for announcements and every time you have an announcement, you just create a new discussion, new discussion post so that the students would know where to go. In my first experience with forums, in every chapter, I create a forum for announcements. And uh, sometimes the students are confused as to the announcement that I have made. Although it sends them an email notification, but there are some students who don't open always their email. So they don't know what are my current um, announcements. But when we have the one forum only for announcements, so before or before or every time they log in to our my soul platform they will go to attendance and then they will also check on announcements i always tell them during my orientation to always check for the announcements if ever there are uh, announcements that have been made uh, prior to the class and uh, it's also important for me, I think, uh, I believe that it is very important to orient students with the types of activities that you will be using. You don't assume that these activities are already familiar with forums. You don't assume that they are already familiar with chat. You don't assume that they are already familiar with how an online quiz works. Um, you have to orient them. You have to discuss it to them through a forum or through live discussion or through a chat instruction so that they would know what to do, how to do it, because there are some students who are really not techy. Although most of our students are already very familiar with the use of computers, there are some, even for uh, before, during my uh, when we still had our face-to-face -face discussions and I teach um, ISB, these are computer classes for our uh, business students. Some of them, they're already in your third year or fourth year. Some of them are still not confident in using the computer. So if they are not confident at the time when we had face-to-face -face discussions, how much more with the online delivery type of learning? So we have to orient them with what they will be doing, what they should do, so that they can always go back to your instructions every time they are confused. Or you, you encourage them to send you um, um, chat or private chat. Now, in our classroom discussion, we have, of course, classroom policies. So we also, it is also very important that we discuss our virtual classroom policies. Like in my case, I tell them regarding, for example, the attendance. Uh, in our normal classroom um, meeting, I consider them late after five minutes or after 10 minutes. But in a virtual classroom, you have to inform them how many minutes would they be considered absent or how many minutes would they still be considered present. Um, I, I make use of the option on students can record their own attendance so that I don't have to keep on calling them one by one every time we have uh, a class, but I will let them record their own attendance, but I will tell them that, okay, I will give you 15 minutes for you to be able to see the present button. Once you log in after 15 minutes, then what you can see would only be the absent uh, button and the, the excuse. Now for the excuse, you have to, to have a valid reason why you were not able to attend uh, the session. Now the reason why I give 15 minutes is that uh, there are some students who have problems with their internet connection. And even I sometimes also have my own problems with internet connection. So uh, I, I, also, I already uh, also consider um, their side. So I give them 15 minutes. Um, they make sure that within 15 minutes, if they can log into that, 
time, then they would still be considered present. But of course, they have to be present uh, after 15 minutes until the session ends. So you can, you can see it when you have your video conference sessions, you will be able to see if they have left the discussion or not. Now for video conference sessions, although it's a synchronous session, we have an option to record your video conference sessions. And I also strongly recommend recording your video conference sessions, especially if you are discussing uh, the chapter, if you, are, you have a very important discussion. Why? Um, so that the students who were not able to attend to your session at that particular schedule or even students who were able to attend but they, they were still, still some parts of the discussion that are not clear to them, they can review the session that you had. So recording your video conference sessions and allowing the students to uh, download and listen to it makes it part of uh, asynchronous delivery at the same time learning. And of course, I would also recommend to download the MySoul mobile app. This is based on my experience. I use MySoul uh, using the website, but then, uh, for example, in the evening or when I am out of the house, I logged into MySoul mobile app and it, it just needs a very small amount of internet data for you to check if you have um, messages from students who needs an answer immediately and you don't have the capacity to go into the website immediately to be able to answer it, you can actually answer it using your MySoul mobile app. And if there are replies to forums and you can also check it there. And uh, the MySoul mobile app also has the option to open the browser. So if that particular um, section needs to be open in a browser, then there is an option there for you to work it or to open it in the using a web browser. But the MySoul uh, really comes in handy as, as a support to your uh, using of MySoul using the website. Okay, um, for me, this is my um, experience in two sentences. Um, asynchronous delivery has helped me cope with the challenges in online learning in terms of internet speed, hardware requirements, limited breaks between classes, and content preparation. With asynchronous delivery, I am able to meet my target objectives for each lesson while not being overwhelmed with having to go live every meeting. With my first uh, summer class with a full blast online learning, it was, uh, although I have been using my soul for a year and a half, it was still, uh, there were still a lot of features that I didn't know. So it was, even if I only had one class and that uh, will start at 1.30, but I, have to spend mga four to five hours on screen for for me to be able to learn the other features of soul and it was it was so i was imagining what will happen when first sem comes when i will already have a lot of classes and i will have um, short time breaks but when i was able to discover more of the features of asynchronous delivery with the second summer with the mid-year term class that i had it was uh, quite uh, more convenient now. I was able to really appreciate asynchronous delivery. And for because I only had eight students for my second um, summer class, so there were times when we do not go on video conference sessions, but instead we go chat. And then I discuss the, the topic, and then I will call on. It's, it's, a, it's similar to a discussion in the classroom or in the live video except that uh, you are just typing your answers and they are able to to participate as well so for me asynchronous delivery is uh, a big help for both students and for teachers okay so i guess that's all that i can share i hope that you're able to get something from what i have 
um, discuss today. So, Sir Dave, Sir Jan, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, um, Mom Myla. That was very instructional and it can open someone's eyes actually. So, um, and now after listening to both speakers, our open forum is now open. You can actually, um, you can actually type your questions in the Q and A icon in your Zoom account, and or else you can actually send another question or type questions in the Facebook page. Okay, so we are waiting for um, the attendees to ask questions. Okay, so um, there are questions here that was answered by our um, speaker a while ago. So um, I think if you don't have questions, I think you are very familiar with asynchronous delivery. And now let us move on to our um, next slide. Oh, we have here questions from Dr. Viola Rose Torres. The question is, how did you handle 50 students in a class? Anyone can answer with this. Um, the um, MBA program has a maximum of 25 students per class. The uh, undergrads in La Sala, I'm talking about La Sala, 40. Uh, I believe it's going to be a lot more challenging. It's challenging enough if you do 50 face-to-face. -face, it's going to be a lot more challenging if you uh, do it online. Because what I do in my classes, there are only 20, 22 of them. I take pains during my, uh, my synchronous sessions. I take pains to call them, to engage them. Uh, during the session, during the three-hour session, so that they just won't feel that they're there and then they just sat through the lecture, which I also do when I do a, when I do face-to-face -face classroom session. I call, I, I, it's my policy to call at least once the students during the three-hour session. Mm -hmm. And I do that also for, for online video lectures. It's going to be a lot more challenging if you have 50 or more, because I know there are some schools who pack their, their, uh, their subjects with that particular number. It's gonna be very taxing for stu for the teachers, no? I know. Uh, I I don't know if you can really have a meaningful discussion uh, other than a yes or no answer. If you want to call fifty students, that that's from my perspective. Yeah, yes, sir. That's right. Well, uh, for it was quite difficult for my uh, first summer class because there were four. Uh, there were forty five. There were 40 students, but for my second summer class, uh, there were only eight. So the chat session was just convenient for us because I can call all of them. I can, uh, I can ask them questions and they, all of them have the chance to answer because there were only eight of them. So I guess really it's, it's a challenge if you have uh, more, uh, more students. So that is why we go into video conferencing or forums would be the option. Parang webinar na siya, Myla, no? if it's going to be 50 or more, like you really have a speaker and then you just listen. It's not the usual classroom that where you engage uh, your students in a question and answer. So, so my take is maybe in, in this kind of a setup, schools might want to limit the number of participants. So you can still have that, that interaction, no? that certain level of intimacy between the teacher and the students. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank okay. You so much. we have here. Um, thank you so much for that answer, sir. And Ma'am Myla, we have here another question from an anonymous um, attendee. So, can we access the MySoul for free, even if we are from the other university? I think this is for Mamila. Um, for actually, MySoul is for uh, the Siliman community, for the students, and for the teachers. But I don't know. With uh, I hope Sir Dave can answer this. If there is a feature for them to to visit to be able to to probably explore the environment, the interface of my soul. But for now, when it comes to accessing the different um, activities, uh, the, the different sections in the my soul, it's, it's exclusive for, for the Siliman community. But it's, it depends on the soul community, a soul admin. Yeah. Um... Uh, my soul is a, a learning the official learning management system uh, of uh, of Siliman University and uh, it's actually powered by uh, open LMS formerly blackboard and uh, what what we have right now in the pipeline is uh, helping other universities especially schools with limited internet connection uh, as part of our extension program um, I don't want to preempt um, our our plan for other HEIs in particular, but uh, just keep be posted because uh, we are planning also to offer um, free training and uh, providing free a uh, free platform for for other um, HEIs in the country. Summative assessment. <laughs> There's a question about summative assessment no? uh, uh, in Canvas. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we call our, our LMS, like your MISO, we call it Animo Space. And like you, it's exclusive for LaSalle faculty and students. No? Uh, I, I also don't know, although we're trying to, just like Seliman, where we have uh, certain engagements where we do training of teachers from other schools. No? Uh, summative assessment. Um, it's more challenging to give exams uh, in online, uh, under online uh, learning, no? because especially if everybody's off-site, uh, there's always the element of control which you cannot have. And so I, I cannot, I, I don't know if this will be applicable to you, but ever since, no, since I'm teaching the master's program, uh, my examination always has elements of take-home. But take-home were, uh, I, I still have my uh, midterm and final examinations, but a portion, 50% of uh, the grade will come from take-home activities where they will either work on an assigned particular topic uh, as a group or with a partner. And so yun, uh, it's take-home, meaning uh, they can access their notes, they can access their books, they can access anything uh, to help them solve the particular problem, it's not going to be material. Well, the, the thing is, uh, what, what, um, what, uh, how, how comfortable will I be that they didn't ask somebody else to solve it? Well, you can only control so much in terms of online learning. And that particular element, uh, you just have to let go and, uh, and just have, uh, just believe that, you know, they're, they're going to be doing the assigned, uh, assigned activity on their own. And you will have, uh, since you've worked with the students and when you see their particular answer, uh, submitted take-home uh, uh, assignments, you will have a feel if they did it on their own or they have outside sources where you can call their attention because you've had a benefit of discussing with them. They have other submissions before. And so as a teacher, you have a particular feel, oops, baka sa iba. Pero so far naman, based on my, uh, I've caught people who have cheated. <laughs> uh, right. Students are quite resourceful. Eh. Sometimes they're able to find solutions of cases somewhere, solutions of problem sets somewhere. And then when they submit it to me, they copy verbatim. As in, wow, sabi ko, di man lang iniba. Oh, so in those instances, dumahuli talaga kasi verbatim. 
Pero in some other things, kung talagang hindi verbatim, tsaka hindi mo na makakopya yung sagot somewhere else, kung pinagawa sa iba, you, you, will ha- you might have a feel eh, because of the way that they answered the particular uh, assessment that you gave them. Oh, but in the end, really, it's like you discuss with them the ethical consideration in classroom discussion, the copying, and all those things. No? And then you, you tell them that, uh, you know, this is uh, part of the things that you do here in school is value formation. So you keep on reminding them, but you can only remind them so much. So in the end, uh, you let go of a certain control, but, but, but being conscious as well, you have to do due diligence when you take a look at mo pinagawa lang nila. Pwede naman. Uh, about you, Myla? Uh, for uh, major exams or for chapter exams, uh, I give them instructions ahead of time that they make sure that they will be logging in because we, we used to make use of Google Meet. Okay. So they, they will log into Google Meet for the video conference and they will log into Seoul for the exam. So um, I will be I will be re- requiring them to turn on their cameras and then they okay. will be sharing their screen. Although I know that after sharing their screen, they can open any <laughs> other <laughs> tabs that they like because uh, it's not locked. It's not yet installed in their browsers. So that is uh, the same also, sir, with what I did. Um, I also remind them that that honesty is very important. Although you are sharing your screen, although I'm telling you to turn around your camera and let me see your work area, but that's the best that I can do for now. If they will still cheat, then it's it's uh, it's their loss already. I, I give them a little um, lecture on, again, values formation. I just remind them that I trust them uh-huh. that they will not cheat. Although, yes, I do uh, caught some of them cheating, even answers to my uh, to my essay, because I when I ask a question, suddenly I I noticed that there were a few two or three of them who had almost the same uh, the same answer, and it was not the the usual composition that okay. uh, that yeah. student makes. So mm-hmm. I was able when I pasted it in Google, bingo, the answer came from that particular website. So I have to to call the attention of the student, of course, privately. Okay. Because I would also ask, why was my, my why was my answer mark zero? So I have to 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 talk to that student privately. That's the best that we okay. can do, uh, I think for now, unless uh, we will, but we will be uh, we are still on the process of exploring other tools that can help us manage our exams. Okay. Oh, there's okay, a question so about we... how, how, do you, how do you handle seven courses in three preparation? Well, it's challenging enough yes. if you handle it. If you handle it in a regular class, uh, I guess it's more challenging if you do it online. So I think the administration of the schools will be cognizant of that, but they have to, they have to make the teachers leave. Also, my God, it's not only like, not only like you know, we want to have so many enrollees, want to accommodate them, so we just keep on giving teachers all this load, because online learning takes more time than the brick and mortar classroom, really. And so I, my heart goes to that teacher who asked seven. Who, he's a, he's a, so anonymous. Eh. Seven courses with three preparations. Nako, talagang kahit anong pabalibalik tadbo, talaga mahihirapan ka dyan. Even in a brick and mortar. Much more for an online learning center. And so I think the administrators will have to open up their eyes na hinahinay lang po tayo kasi bago pong setup ito. Bawasan po natin yung workload ng mga teachers po natin and even the number of students na ina-assign natin sa kanila. Because everybody's adjusting eh. We're in this learning curve right now eh. And maybe siguro one or two terms after, mas mamaalam na tayo, maybe we can go back to more load. Pero right now, it will serve us better if we can, you know, reduce the load of people. Because your teachers are not machines. They're not Arnold Schwarzenegger. We're all flesh and blood who tayo lahat dito. Okay? Yung po yung take-out po doon sa question na yan. Kawawa naman po kayo. Yes, it's, it is really a challenge. <laughs> 
Okay, so thank you for that, um, sir. Okay, so um, we will accommodate one more um, questions here. I'm Leona, Leonida. I'm just old with the presenters and trying to visualize and how to go about in a synchronous learning. Um, just share any thoughts about this? How to, ano? what was the question, what is, Anjan? What is that, sir? There's a short question here about how many minutes would you say students is considered absent in an online class? Well, yung policy namin sa Lasal, uh, hindi, hi, dati kasi merong maximum absences. Eh. Ngayon, we, we do not count the absences of students. Parang kung gusto mo umaten sa online learning, fine. Kung ayaw mo umaten, fine. It's your responsibility. So, unlike dati na uh, classroom na bibilangin mo yung, uh, uh, yung attendance, ngayon hindi ka hindi ka obligated sa faculty. Hindi mo pwedeng ibagsak yung estudyante dahil absence siya ng more than three times. So that's one of the things that we have adopted. Let's see. So parang sinasabi mo doon sa estudyante, oh, you're, you're not, it's not your responsibility uh, na meron tayong online learning platform. You come, if you like, uh, you'll be mature enough to be present. If you're not present, you miss the things that we discuss in class, you, you, uh, you do your thing to make up for that. So yun yung policy na. In question, uh, Jan, in question, and you know, Mr. Miss Biola. I mean. Okay, so um, there are um, a lot of people commending your presentation this afternoon for both speakers. So that ends our open forum. Um, the next part is. Um, Let's move on to the next part, which is the giving of the certificate to our speakers. Salamat po. Pleasure is ours. Okay. So, allow me to read a citation. Salaman University, ICI Mariano C. Lau Technology Laboratory, presents this certificate of recognition to Dr. Dennis L. Berino for sharing his valuable knowledge as a guest speaker during the sixth series of Dr. Mariano Lau webinar series with the topic Asynchronous Delivery, which was held on the 8th of August 2020 via Zoom online. Signed, our very own project leader of Dr. Mariano Lau ICI Laboratory, Dr. Dave E. Marshall. Dave, walang Silvana? Paborito mo yung Silvana niya sa Dumaguete. Oh, soon. Soon, Denny. Soon. Joke lang, joke lang. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so same citation will be given to Assistant Professor Myla Jean P. Sardan. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure is ours. Okay, so to bring something to a successful conclusion, Asynchronous learning is one of the most effective forms of learning and training. So again, um, we still have a lot of topics for the upcoming Saturdays. On screen is the topic for the next Saturday, which is student engagement in an online learning environment. And we had a whale of time this afternoon seeing our attendees via Zoom and Facebook Live. But before we go, let me announce that we should submit our evaluation or the post-webinar survey after this session, which will be automatically appear on screen after this webinar. Make sure to do this so that you can complete your participation in this webinar and we will be able to send your certificate. Okay. So um, we will ascertain another topic from another speaker next Saturday. So we hope to see you again. This has been your moderator, John St. Lado Palama. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, John. Thanks, Myla. Thanks, Dave. See you next Thank time. You. Thank you, Denny. Thank you. Yes. Bye-bye. Uh... Bye-bye.